Hi, my name is Sharon Chen. I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician, and I take care of many children with respiratory viral infections. In this video, I want to share with you the important concepts about all respiratory viruses. I will also introduce you to the anatomic framework that we will use in this video and in other subsequent videos that dive deeper into each respiratory virus. This video is an overview about all respiratory viruses with a focus on the clinical syndromes. The learning objectives are to define the different syndromes caused by respiratory viruses and to name the main viral pathogens. Here is the pathogen list for our course, and in this video and the entire module, I will be discussing these viruses that cause respiratory infections. Respiratory viral infections are something that I know you have all experienced personally and that you will see a lot of as a physician. You will usually not know which virus is causing your patient's symptoms. But in this video, we will teach you about the clinical syndromes and the hallmark viruses that cause these syndromes so that you can make an educated guess. We want you to learn what the typical clinical presentation is of each one of these respiratory viruses so that you can make a better decision about when not to give antibiotics or when your patient may get clinically worse and need to be in the hospital. Now the pie chart here shows you some of the uh, names of the common respiratory viruses. And as you can see, rhinovirus and influenza virus um, are quite prevalent. Now, it may be daunting to learn all these respiratory viruses, so the ones that I just named, uh, and their biology and what symptoms they cause, um, but we've created a way to simplify this all for you. The beauty about clinical syndromes of respiratory viruses is that they can actually be organized anatomically. So in the next series of images, well, I'll show you the clinical syndromes and their associated hallmark or typical virus mapped anatomically to the upper and lower respiratory tract. This can help you later when you review this material. We will discuss each one of these clinical syndromes and their associated virus in depth in later videos. Now think back to the last time you had a cold. What was the most annoying symptom that you had? Many of you might have said a stuffy nose or congestion, dripping mucus. And this clinical syndrome is what we call rhinitis. And so this is specifically infectious rhinitis, not allergic rhinitis. It involves inflammation of the nasal cavity only. And the typical viruses that cause rhinitis are rhinovirus and coronavirus. Further down the upper respiratory tract is the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and vocal cords. When this area is infected, we get clinical syndromes of sore throat and hoarseness, and we term these pharyngitis and laryngitis. The viruses that typically infect these locations are different than those that infect the nasal cavity. Adenovirus and parainfluenza virus are the most prominent viruses. We've decided to define the lower respiratory tract as below the vocal cords. And in general, lower respiratory tract infections can be more severe because the infection can affect gas exchange leading to hypoxia. The smaller airways or bronchioles are also easier to fill up with a lot of mucus and this causes breathing problems. Sometimes these patients will actually have to be hospitalized and that's in contrast to the majority of patients who have upper respiratory tract infections. One clinical syndrome that's classic in young children is croup. And this is also known as laryngotracheobronchitis. The word croup comes from the sound of the cough, which is hoarse and barking. And young children are more affected because the size of the airway is smaller. Croup involves swelling of the area right below the vocal cords. We'll discuss a lot more about croup in later videos. The typical virus that causes croup is parainfluenza. Lower down the lower respiratory tract are the large bronchi that branch off the trachea at the level of the crina. Infection of bronchi causes bronchitis, and inflammation of the mucous membranes of the bronchi leads to a lot of secretions, and then that needs to be cleared by coughing. Patients with bronchitis have a lot of coughing, and this cough can actually last for many weeks. Any of the common respiratory viruses can cause bronchitis, and we've listed them on this slide. The bronchi branch off into smaller airways called bronchioles. An infection of bronchioles is called bronchiolitis, which is clinically more severe in infants and young children. The size of the bronchioles in infants and young children are smaller compared to adults, and thus it's easier to block up with all the mucus and cellular debris. Most of the respiratory viruses can also cause this clinical syndrome. 
But RSV, which is short for respiratory syncytial virus, is the typical virus for bronchiolitis. At the end of the bronchial trees are the alveoli, and this is where gas exchange occurs. When these areas are involved with in infection of the alveolar epithelium, we call this pneumonia. Inflammation around the alveoli decreases gas exchange, and this can lead to hypoxia and really increases the severity of this particular infection. All of the respiratory viruses can cause pneumonia. Influenza is the typical virus that causes viral pneumonia. The anatomic framework, we hope, will allow you to organize and remember these respiratory viruses. The location of the infection determines the clinical symptoms, and certain viruses have a predilection for infecting certain locations. However, it is important to remember that there's a lot of overlap. Many of these viruses can cause many of these clinical syndromes. What we listed on this slide are the most typical respiratory viruses for each clinical syndrome. Sometimes respiratory viral infections can be complicated by secondary bacterial infections. The same anatomic locations that I showed you for the respiratory virus infections can also manifest clinical syndromes due to bacteria infection. For example, a viral rhinitis can be complicated by a bacterial infection of the sinus causing sinusitis. Now some of these clinical syndromes that I've listed on this slide can be bacterial infections without a preceding viral infection. For example, strep throat is a pharyngitis caused by streptococcus pyogenes, and bordetella pertussis can cause bronchitis. Different from respiratory viral infections, bacteria infections of the upper and lower respiratory tract need to be treated with antibiotics. These bacterial infections that I've listed on this slide will be discussed in depth in other modules. The last clinical syndrome that is listed on this particular image is pneumonia. This is a very important clinical syndrome to pay attention to because some of these patients can actually have really severe infection. So when we take care of patients with pneumonia, uh, we want to distinguish whether that pneumonia is caused by a virus or a bacteria. And this is not so easy. The clinical symptoms are pretty similar. Um, but if you happen to get a chest x-ray, the typical chest x-rays can look quite different. So in general, viral pneumonias tend to be diffuse affecting both lungs. And so the chest x-ray I'm showing you here is of a 12-month-old infant uh, who is presenting with rapid breathing and cough. And what you can see in this chest x-ray is this haziness in both sides of the lungs. And this suggests a very diffuse process. Bacterial pneumonias can have many patterns on chest x-rays, but in general, they tend to be more focal. So this chest x-ray on the right is of a six-year-old little girl. She has fever, cough, chest pain when she's breathing. And what you can see is a demarcated area of whiteness in the left lung. This represents alveoli filled with inflammatory infiltrate within that particular lung segment. Now keep in mind that this is a broad generalization. There are bacteria, such as mycoplasma, that can also cause a generalized abnormal, abnormal pattern of both lungs.